Hey everyone, coming to see this dog and pony, huh? I guess they weren't offering donuts in the other breakouts. Oh, that's their sad loss. All good. Good, good, good. We'll give it maybe one more minute. We're right here at 210. Get the most fun here. You are not kidding, Nick. You are not kidding. Again, I have this unicorn job. I get to purvey fun, hopefully. There's Mark's going to come in. Let me. Uh, so I do have the lovely Ileana who's helping me on the backside here. I appreciate you're all coming in muted, but it's okay. You will be able to unmute when you wish to. Uh, you can certainly use the chat function. If there's something that's up on a slide or something occurs to you, oh, I want to ask him that question right now. Please do. Don't be shy. This isn't really a shy group. I was reading all the chat you were producing just a minute ago. Um, but please feel free, open your mic. Hi, this is Nick Perry and I'm from XYZ, you know, whatever part of the world. And my question is whatever, and I will try to answer that uh, because I know sometimes we think of things that are very important to us right now. And I wanna make sure that we answer those. We don't wait for Q and A at the end and oh, I had my burning point and now I'm thinking about what he said about tortoises, so. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, just remember that we're on social media. We're on Twitter, on Instagram, hashtag RCOE Esports. Got it. And welcome to the virtual Riverside County Esports Symposium. And my name is Ileana Mendoza. I'm gonna be the moderator for today. Um, I'm here to provide virtual support for both you and the presenter. So if you have any questions or need assistance with the Zoom interface, you can uh, use the chat icon on the toolbar and look for moderator and you can send a direct message to me. The title of the session today is Why and How It's Okay to Play Video Games. And our presenter today is Kevin Brown. And with that, we launch. All right, let me share screen. Do I want to continue? Yes, I do. All right, let's give you all drinking from the fire hose. Let's take this really quickly. We've got about 48 minutes and I've got about 46 slides, but we don't have to linger on anything, one thing in particular, but I do want to explore this concept. And many of you, I believe we're right now just at uh, the uh, kickoff panel. So you're getting an idea that this is a good idea, that there may be something around esports and education and kids and social emotional learning. So let's explore why and how. I'll talk about the why, I'll show you some research, I'll share with you curriculum. I will also give you an inkling about how we actually do this. I hold seminars several times every month uh, for our, both our national affiliates, individual school districts, international partners, and show them how we can take curricula you're already using or chunks that you want to borrow from NACEP and intersperse those into what it is you do already. So all that, available free of charge for you. Let's get going here. So you heard us say that the battle cry is just this. What we're doing is meeting kids where they are. I, we explained previously that kids, when given the moment of free time, they're on their phones, they're on consoles or devices, they're, on, they're using their PC while they should be finishing their math homework. They're also leveling up in World of Warcraft. So we know that they're here. They are already digitally native. We're leaning into a strength and a structure, this community of practice that they have. And now, sort of sneakily showing them what I call chocolate broccoli. They need the smarts, they need the good things that education provides, but they don't often like the taste of it depending on the way it's packaged. So eSports provides that lovely robe of chocolate and allows them to want to explore things. It gives them this idea about what the Japanese call ikigai, two words, two kanji, two characters, ikigai, my being purpose. How can I find something that leans into right there in the middle of that diagram, my passion and my mission, what I feel I'm good at as a person, what I want to do in my life for which I can actually be paid, but that also might serve the bigger human community. If there's a way to put all that together, we call this in Japanese ikigai, there's a reason for being. And that's what we're trying to give out to our students. Show them that life does not have to be dull. You don't just have to do what your mother and father did. You don't have to become anything other than what you can and want to be. Now, I don't mean to fly in the face of parents and you know make those kinds of decisions, but we're allowing kids to explore a potential role, a function in society by means of esports. And how do we do that? 
think the slides will advance. Uh, it's by building this culture of scholastic esports. Let me move this forward. There we go. And it's a three legged school. It should say scholastic esports on the slide. It's first formed of a community. So we've got four major stakeholders you can see right there. We do want students, obviously it's of, by, and for them, this idea about forming esports clubs, but we want mom and dad involved. Just like we want them involved in classical education, parents are our partners in what we do. And it's very important that they understand that this is not just a waste of time, it's a road to a scholarship at a college for a child, their child, to lean into a career potentiality that maybe they didn't even know existed. Kids are now creating and looking at jobs that don't even exist yet. So this is one way to do it. We do so by creating and offering up curriculum free of charge. As you heard me say previously, we started with English language arts, but now we are leaning into physics, classical sciences and STEM. History gets uh, a boost at this point. I saw many of you write favorite game, Civilization VI, love it. I'm working with a group of grad students, many of whom are history buffs or at a history major or minor, and we're looking to find a way to sort of weaponize, use Civilization VI to say, what if Genghis Khan had had a better PR person? Would he have had to ride the horses across all of Asia, or could he have had a better attractive plan to bring people into the fold? What an interesting way to learn if we could pitch it that way. I think kids would pick up history a lot more easily. Lastly, what NACEF does differently than almost any other organization out there trying to say they're for esports or good for kids in an educational way is that we form clubs. We don't form teams. We don't make players out of kids. We don't promise we're going to put you in front of recruiters. We say, let's form a club because not every kid who comes to an esports club is a gamer. They don't all like to play and maybe not the games you're playing for your tournaments. But there is a way for them to feel fulfilled that they are doing something for their larger community where they can strut what it is they do, whether they're a graphic artist or a game designer, if they just love building a rig that's going to get better frames per second, all of those things are necessary and part of a club function. I'm looking around, I see a lot of knitted eyebrows. Questions at this point before we move on? Ileana says no, so off we go. So who do we serve? We started with high schools. This was the first ask. We started with 25 high schools back in 2017. And now we're almost 1,200 high schools across North America. But you would imagine, as soon as we get high schools up on the blocks, those younger brothers and sisters who were looking at their enamored brothers and sisters in high school said, hey, I want some of that. And that's actually what happened with me. My grandson was uh, in school a couple of years ago. He was a sixth grader. And his principal asked me, so what's this job you do? And why do you do it? And how do you do it? And do you have curriculum about that? And that's what allowed us to start molding this so that middle school could have something. And then we had uh, YMCA first, but Boys and Girls Club, the Scouts, different faith-based organizations said, we'd like to do something for our unique communities. How about us? Can you help us? There's certainly a way through and forward through all of that. So we serve all these kinds of groups. Elementary, without a doubt, is going to be up on the blocks next year. We have things written out for elementary. It's a different kind of experience, you would imagine, if you're starting first grade, second grade, third grade. Uh, but we are always thinking about that. So the thinking started with research. Uh, as uh, James O'Hagan and Dennis Large and others said, uh, part of our closing panel we'll bring to you Dr. Constance Steinkuhler. She is the lead researcher working with NACEF. She is housed at the University of California, Irvine. Her life's work has been in informatics, human game interface, neurobiology. She and her husband both are leading researchers in this field. She having been uh, actually part of the Obama administration's Office of Science and Technology, she wrote US policy on education and esports, a powerhouse in this field, and she games wait, I can do something through the advent of technology. I'll actually share with you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second. I'm going to pop in a little video about her just so you get an idea who this amazing person is and how what she has done as her life's work began to backfill and fund our, our whole idea about how can we take this research and apply this in a scholastic fashion. So let me make sure I've got, looks like the right screen. Uh, let me pick the, there we go. And I'll be right there with you. And this should fire off nicely. Here we go.
My name is Constance Steinkuhler. I'm a full professor here in informatics and I study games. My expertise is on social interaction and cognition. My game of choice tends to be player versus player kind of online games. I'm really interested in all of the social interaction and social sort of collaboration and competition that happens in games and then around the games. And we have a lot of uh, different faculty here who are actually working on game related topics. The connection between esports and STEM, between esports and academics generally, Gaming is, is, is a very cerebral and smart kind of activity. In their game spaces, they're doing like really high-end theory crafting, they're doing data science. It's a ton of delayed gratification. And if you're gonna get good at any of the games, it takes a lot of work, it takes hours of discipline, of play. And so the idea that they're kind of barren intellectually, it's sort of a foolish idea the moment you pick up a title. It takes screen time and it turns it into activity time. In today's kind of climate, we really understand underestimate how important it is just to play and to do things because they're interesting and fun. It's actually an important part of development. It takes screen time and turns it into activity time. Let's just sit with that thought for just a second while I roll this back to uh, where we want to go today. That's just it. There was a comment in the chat earlier about, so how does this actually work? What, what are you doing? Um, I'll show you in another screen here. Let me show what that research actually looks like. Let's go to this one. So research shows us that for the last 10 to 15 years, esports leans into certain aspects of learning, but again, with a, an, an applied outcome. So when kids learn math, that they're learning how to do statistics, if they're looking at the way a series of numbers can indicate a potentiality, that can be a very dry exercise. How many days will it rain next year if we counted this many days of rain this year and I'm in New Mexico versus I'm in Kauai, Hawaii? Uh, that can be just a thought exercise. But if I go to my sixth, seventh, eighth graders and I ask them, instead of blurring past that last screen in Super Smash Brothers, but directly look at the stats and see how many times you launched somebody out off the island versus how many times you yourself got KO'd. And I start to look at those numbers. I can begin now to build a theory around who makes a better squad. Is it Kirby and Peach? Is it Bowser and Peach? Is it Bowser and Kirby? Kids will do that all day when they see some kind of applicability. So this is important learning for us. They are able to apply scientific reasoning um, I'll show you a graph in just a moment about how language learning, many of our kids that work in our schools, uh, come to our schools here in Southern California, but certainly anywhere in the United States, English may not be their first or second language spoken at home. So the nerve wracking idea about I have to stand in front of a class, I had to put together a paper in a language that wasn't mine, are my colleagues going to laugh at my accent, do I use the right vocabulary, none of that matters in gaming. What matters is hearing and understanding and reacting, speaking with authenticity and, and, and conviction about what's happening, shot calling, so my team can excel and move on. Don't care about what you sound like necessarily, just what you're telling me, is it important for what's going on in the game? Uh, certainly kids are strong, technologically fluid people, and we can now use this to our advantage. So we've got over 70 years of uh, data about traditional sports. And this is important because we're seeing parallels. So the ball sports, the wet sports, like as they laughed about my swimming and water polo in high school, uh, this teaches me certain things, certain things about community. I have to, in order to be on a, a squad, I have to maintain a grade point average. We're tying scholasticism to play right there. So in NASA, we do something very similar. You have to have a 2.0 grade point average to be part of any uh, esports club. We've got many campuses that say that's nice, but we want our kids to stretch further, whether because we want to be a magnet school, we want to show off that our kids are better, or because we know that we've got uh, a neighborhood where we are not doing the best we can. We want to meet and exceed, exceed state standards. So we're going to ask for a 3.0. And if you happen to get into finals with your play, or I should say playoffs with your esports club, we're gonna ask you to ratchet that up to 3.25. We want you to make sure your scholasticism is matching how well you're doing in your game. So you're not thinking that, oh, I'm here for the club and I don't have to do things for my school. We know that as James O'Hagan said, that there is a great amount of personal growth and the sense of satisfaction and completion by being part of a team, channeling what you can do, what you can bring to the strength and the will of others 
uh, to get on and to, uh, to succeed. So let me show you, uh, this was year one graphic. Uh, it takes a little bit of a while, as many of you may know, to get data out of university research. It has to go through full IRB uh, review board betting, uh, vetting, I should say, before we publish it. But something we can publish and show you, it's very difficult to see the small letters at the bottom of the screen, but if you blur your eyes, blue and green are science and math respectively. So at the end of every season, NASEF conducts uh, surveys with the University of California, Irvine, whether it is uh, this way through a phone call where it's face to face or we send out uh, electronic surveys and students send them back. But we ask them, how has what you have learned helped you in esports? How has esports shown an ability to take what you've learned and do something with it? And they say, yeah, science and math, we do get to use some of those things, specifically with our problem solving skills, how we look at things, what data analysis looks like. We can use those. As I mentioned in the yellow English language arts, we have this idea that I feel more secure in my ability to communicate and I do it more frequently and I am uh, upheld by my team when I do that. What's amazing is what's in the orange. Something that's to a factor of eight in some cases greater than other components is the social emotional learning that goes on. Now, many of you may think uh, or have heard data that says that, you know, violent games get violent kids. Shooters make shooters. And I will tell you right now, as I say in all of these kinds of conferences and meetings, that there is no credible research that says that in any way. There is nothing that shows in any kind of research that violence makes in games makes violent kids. This actually, our research shows quite the opposite, that the antidote to that so-called violent thought pattern or behavior, or this antisocial nature, this bullying, or this isolationism is actually addressed by esports and clubs, that we bring kids into this communal space where they can show off their skill set. But the team realizes, the club realizes, you have things we need, we can all benefit. So it actually does enhance the experience. Kids feel more valued. They begin to moderate themselves and realize, hey, what I just said is what we call a little bit salty, a little bit spicy. And maybe it's not the best way to address that issue. I, <coughs> pardon me, need to find other better ways to express myself and then to make myself part of this team. So hugely insightful, I think. So let's bring all these pieces together. What we've got is the learning and the values that we want in our schools, in our districts on the one side, and the fun and the play, the passion that kids have for games, put those together. And this is esports. We can define it as this intentional use of esports, of uh, video game competitions as a vehicle for learning. So this becomes our hook, our chocolate broccoli. Before I launch into curriculum, questions at this point? Are you seeing anything in the chat, Ileana? No, Looks there's like nothing. No. Very good. All right, so let's talk about that. Research formed our first attempts at creating curriculum. And as I said, we had many different hoops to jump through. I was one of the first uh, people consulted and they said, okay, we want you to write a course around English language arts. Uh, through the lens of CTE, but specifically pointed at esports. And as I said, I, I rage quit and said, ridiculous. It's a waste of time. Why would you even do that? Until I saw this diagram on the right hand side with the players in, this, in the middle, what we typically think about esports stereotypically. Uh, that's looking at this diagram, thinking that esports is only about the players, is like saying NASCAR is only about the car and the driver and 500 left hand turns. There's so much more that goes into NASCAR. It's the same thing with video gaming. So that if you see those four white circles, those are the domains that we are positing. That each one of these is an essential lever that has to be pulled for there to be any kind of gaming at all. And I suppose these days I, I put the, the number five, the sort of membrane that layers over all of this is health and wellness. This attendance to what makes me healthy? Am I checking myself in? Do I understand what my body and mind go through when I game? I need to eat properly. I need to hydrate. I need to exercise. I need time away to breathe and sleep. All of that's part of gaming. So to be able to write curriculum about this, there are lots of metrics. We have California Common Core standards. Everything's got a standard. There are also career tech education standards because as I said, we want this to roll out into the world of work. Each one of those domains has a kind of work attached to it, three to five different kinds of jobs, which line up to about 10 different California state CTE standards. Next generation and uh, ISTE standards also play into this as well as social emotional learning. So for us, when we first created it, our first run was this. We uh, wrote in about a month, 
Uh, standards for English classes, we broke them up in this way so that nine got games and simulation as a freshman, which is great because in English classes, as freshmen, we're learning about the narrative. We're learning about the hero's journey, which is the basis of all video gaming, whether it's role-playing gaming or it's a multiplayer, massive online battle arena. We start with somebody, a hero, a heroine on her journey and how they go. So it took us about four months to get this through the state of California, UCOP, the University Office of the President, finally looked at us and said, so you got something going on. We will now authorize those classes. And that gave us the fortitude to say, let's go bigger. Let's go bigger, go home. So what we developed at NACEF, I came up with the idea about drawing out these grids. Think of them like, and it's very small print that I'll make this deck available to you. Uh, it is a plan that takes you from freshman through senior. You are getting all of your A through G college entry requirements met by courses that we've written that intersports esports plus a discipline, history, social science, maths, uh, classical science, lab science, English language arts, still working on foreign language. That's a the favorite of mine. I speak several languages myself and I'm beginning to work with foreign language teachers to see if we can do esports to Nihongo, if we can do esports in Japanese or Francais or Espanol. We've got ways to do that. But on the left-hand side of the screen, interesting, there is a whole column that shows over here the career tech education pathway. This particular grid is centered on the content creative grid or the domain, specifically about fandom art. So here's a young lady, she comes into high school and she doodles and she does 3D design and has made maybe some, some apps on her iPhone and she can play certain games. Uh, but she wants to figure out where does this go with me? So she signs up for the esports club, but then can also take classes that will enhance her interest in, in this case, video game and video game design. She takes the intro, the, con the concentrator and the completer, ends up with job related skills that industry is looking for, perhaps industry certifications, at the same time taking all of her other classes. So A through G meeting all of her college entry and then also on the far right hand side, working with community colleges or four year colleges who are granting us dual enrollment credit. So kids as early as freshmen or sophomores can begin to get college credit, changing the argument from should I go to college? Do I go to college? Nobody in my family's ever gone to college to I see a way forward for me. Where do I want to go to college? Who will have a major that will complete the interesting thing, this journey I started on in high school? As I said, the U.S. Department of Education has gifted me a grant whereby I've got three of these kinds of grids at local high schools in Santa Ana, California. For the next three years, we're doing this study to see how these kinds of educational premises can be used for kids for their benefit. As soon as we put it out there for high school, guess who wants in? Middle school, right? They had this thing. So we, uh, I, I wrote up curriculum, tested it on my grandson in his class at that point. We had mixed sixth, seventh, and eighth graders and did it for a quarter as their eighth period uh, student enrichment class. They were gaming. We gamed. We played. What, we had the class three days a week, 47 minutes. We gamed exactly 23 minutes a week, the back half of Friday. We did not game during class. And when we did have purposeful play, it was to show how what you're doing in the game relates back to what we learned this week, whether it was in marketing or it was in color theory and how do we write ads to attract different other kids for equity and inclusion's sake or how we can become entrepreneurs and hit up the principal for funding so we too can have a shirt with a logo on it that identifies me as an esports club member. We had that sort of applicability. This also extends into these uh, community-based organizations like YMCA who've done this and also run similar eight to nine week programs around this theory. So you may be thinking, I'm sitting here listening to this, maybe I wanna raise my hand, maybe it's me, but which kinds of teachers should be esports teachers? And I'll tell you any kind of teacher. It's whoever raises her or his hand and says, I'm daring, I game, I'll take that or I don't know a thing about this. I don't even play Candy Crush, but my kids come to me. They know that I'll open my space. I'll let them play on my computers during, you know, during lunch after school. They know and trust what I'm saying. You have support. If you're that teacher, there's a way that any teacher can participate. We can show you this way forward. So if you don't mind, first time I'm doing this in any kind of symposium or conference like this, I'm gonna show you a little bit about what it actually looks like to work with me on this exact theory. I do workshops that are anywhere from four to eight hours long, or we do it multi-day. Uh, we did this last week for the country of Mexico. We had six states in Mexico for four straight days, 
four hours a day, go through this process whereby we took curricula from teachers who like to teach what they like to teach, the way they like to teach it, and showed them how they're going to integrate esports, more of a condiment and less of a, a main meal, but how they can do this for their classes. I always must be hungry when I think about designing curriculum because everything's got a food metaphor with me. That or I'm a Taurus and I love to cook. But for me, this is kind of like cake. Cake needs ingredients and you follow a recipe. So cake starts very simply. You only need five ingredients to make a cake. They're right there on the screen. That makes Old Virginia pound cake right there. It's four, three, two, one. And with those five ingredients, you've got yourself cake. Add one bit of difference. What do we add here? Cocoa powder. And actually, they called out salt. Usually, I put that in with my flour. But cocoa powder gets added, and now I've got a different kind of cake. It's still cake. It's still got the form, but the flavor, something interesting has changed about it. And then this, maybe this is holiday themed, but can anybody tell me quickly in the chat, what are we looking there? What cake is that? Splayed out there with all those many ingredients. Anybody? Virginia's typing, Nicholas is typing, Benjamin's thinking about it, never had this horrible thing. Have you never seen that holiday fruitcake? Heads are nodding, this is it. That's what fruitcake looks like, but guess what? As complex as that is, it still goes back to those same five ingredients. Well, guess what? When we take esports and we decide to add it to our curricular base, it's the same thing. So the ingredients that we're bringing into this Obviously, we've got our four domains that we're thinking about for esports. How do I know it's an esports related thing? There are four domains. There's a content creator, or there's an entrepreneur, a strategist, or an organizer. Something of that flavor needs to exist in my class for me to make it sound and feel and taste like esports. Project based learning. Esports is an experiential, hands on uh, environment. And so too should be a class that wants to resonate with an esports vibe. It's got to be experienced. You cannot just read about Genghis Khan. You got to do something with the Mongol Lord. So we've got to keep that in mind. We have high school curricular uh, elements that are built, but then so does every teacher. Every teacher knows what he or she likes to teach. They have their cool projects that they do that they know. Kids wake up early, stay up late to do them because they are engaged. They like to do it. And as teachers, we like these things. It's why we got into teaching. Because you've got, whether it's The Great Gatsby or you're reading um, Endgame as an actual Marvel graphic novel, that's literature. It counts for talking about the narrative. It doesn't have to be Bullfinch and its mythology. That was, a, I didn't mean the word. I wasn't crying Bullfinch on somebody. I meant Bullfinch's mythology. And then what we add to it is I've adapted Scrum methodology, what we use in IT space to develop curriculum or develop, I should say, an IT program or a process for a client. We use that same kind of mentality to create in iterations what this uh, curriculum might look like. So we've got some rules of the road, operating rules, things like we've got to suspend disbelief. If we're going to add esports into curricula, I'll tell you, as the first person to do this, uh, I did not believe it. I took the money. I got paid to do it. And I was grumbling, yeah, this is never going to work. But when I saw that paradigm, I went, okay, now I know what my goal is. I got to realize that I'm walking in earth. I play games, but I'm not a gamer. I don't identify as such. So I've got to give up my own sacred cows. I think I teach very well for the subject I teach, but I've got to be willing to make something that I can use, but give it up so somebody else can use it. Uh, and then don't be shy about the fact that new is not bad, but veteran is also good. So here's my thought. Again, I must have been hungry when I designed this. So cake is science and art. On the left side, cake, all the ingredients have a specific function. This is Alton Brown 101 from the Food Channel. The reason you have flour in a cake is because flour fills out the form. Well, class length determines the form of our classes. Salt and soda give the lift to cake. Well, so do relevant projects. When kids see how they can apply their learning and you give them a chance to prove it through mastery of a particular, whether it is a report, it's a project, it's something collaborative, then we've got lift, we've got rise. Flavor can be whatever one of those classes you pick. So if you're a Spanish teacher, that's your flavor. If you're a history teacher, that's your flavor. And it should be something that's interesting for you because you've got to teach it. You want your brilliance to shine. Let me look at chat really quickly. How many weeks does the 11th grade ELA curriculum require? It's built for a year. We actually wrote year-long curricula 
Uh, and so does that mean you have to do it all year? Do you need to replace your English class? You don't have to, but I do know several high schools that are running it as a secondary track to bring in kids. Uh, I'll tell you that if this works for everybody, ELD, ELA learners, this brings in kids on spectrum, kids with job coaches, with IEPs. It works just as well. You cannot distinguish who's the kid on a program versus who's a kid who's mainstream. It all looks the same because of the way they pull for this. Nom, 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 exactly right. Thank you. So esports, same thing. Cake applies. So the scrum looks like this. We go through several hours. I work with a school, a school district to say, we, Kevin, we've got, so I went to Florida a lot before pre-COVID. Uh, spent a lot of time out there and I'd spend my Saturdays. We'd be in Broward County, we'd be in Port St. Lucie, we'd be in Miami-Dade, and we would set aside hours on a Saturday and go through iterations. First thinking, let's pick a domain. I'm an English teacher. What is it about English and my sophomores? Well, I'm learning about expository writing. Okay, the goal of that being what? To get in front of people and to convince, to persuade, to educate. Sounds entrepreneurial to me. So if we're in the entrepreneur domain, what are the functions of entrepreneur? What are those things? Okay, corporate sponsorship or a marketing campaign. Now I see an inroad as an English teacher. I'm gonna write a marketing campaign and this is how I'm going to lean into it and I can rebuild projects based around this concept that now have application through esports and maybe the club. So then, we, then what we do is we set about ironing it out, put it out there, look at our standards, look at what we do and go through a series of iterations, sort of pounding the steel until we back into what it is we've got as a final product. We did this late November last year, about this time last year. And I had teachers go right out of that Saturday session and take it right into class on Monday morning because they were excited. They felt revitalized and they felt refreshed that what they could teach their students was now infused with this esports ideology that kids were gonna get it and kids were gonna sit up and go, you know, writing that paper, not such a bad idea because I'm writing about Ninja or I'm writing about Flea, my favorite uh, talking head about Fortnite. I'm gonna tell you why what he does is amazing and here's what's important. Or in Mexico, who is the lady GM that owns the Mexican high school and college esports scene and how did she get there and why is she a role model to me? These become easy papers to write that kids want to do. How are we doing so far, everybody? Some head shakes, nobody going, oh my God, he said donuts, you promised. You're talking about cake, I'm hungry. I get it. So a little bit about what NACEF does. When we form clubs, again, this community that you're going to form, it's going to exist in the after-school space. Learning can happen in this after-school space as well, but it's all founded on mission, vision, values. The same things that you have painted on the walls of your school, without a doubt. If I go through schools, I'll see six pillars of our, you know, our Chapman High or our El Medina Spartans. These are what we do. Here are our standards. We've got standards too. And we hold all club members responsible to and for them. Although it's down tucked away in that right-hand corner, probably the most important, we talked about this earlier, was this code of conduct. NACEF has certain things that are inviolate. We expect these of all NACEF club members everywhere, all over the world. Don't care if things are different in Israel to be one of our club members, we need the following. But then we also want clubs to modulate that for what's important about them, their school, their values, so that they can see themselves as these scholar gamers on their own campuses. So we set to writing about that. We provide these five C's. We help you form clubs. There's curriculum there if you want it, then I can help you dial this in specifically for use during the bell, after the bell, whenever you want it. Obviously through career tech education, we point the pathway toward career potentiality. We do offer competitions. Twice uh, a year, we have had competitions. Uh, now it's two games a season. We are just now coming into the, the finals for Overwatch and for Rocket League. How many of you know what Rocket League is? Good, I see some hands up. Others know Rocket League is soccer played by Corvettes and monster trucks. It is an amazing game, high-paced, three-dimensional, kids are doing these. Physics teachers are using Rocket League as a model to prove vector math and how we can do things with a time-space continuum equation, how you've got to be someplace to be able to catch and flick the ball so your colleague down the way can make the goal. It's amazing use. So 
for, during those competition times, we provide free coaching. If you are playing with us as a club and you're playing Overwatch or Rocket League, let's say for this last semester, and you want coaching because you yourself don't know the game or your kids want to get better at it, we provide that through a third-party uh, group that works with us through the University of California, Irvine. They're called Connected Camps. Their kids are graduate students who are specially trained to be able to work amongst uh angsty esportsy high school students but who also go through background checks and thumbprint scans just like we all do as teachers they are the right kinds of people who are experts in their game but who also are near peer mentors that can talk to kids about college life and the rights and wrongs of club mentality and how to exist and coexist on teams so i'm seeing chat fire off let me read really quickly physics are a lot of fun mind bending benjamin hair pulling why i won't do it it moves way too quick for me Yes, looking about, uh, that's where you were in HSEL. Good for you, Nicholas. Excellent. Yes, another so easy to learn, so hard to master. How many of you play Among Us or Fallout? Same kind of thing. That's like the new game that's there. So all of these things we offer you completely free of charge. This is the philanthropy that's underpinning NACEF and will be in our worldwide Scholastic Esports uh, Foundation. We offer these things free of charge because we really believe that kids need an opportunity to learn that education is a right. And anything we can do to help further that should be made free and available. Now we talk about how can we do this on an ongoing basis? What if I don't have time to put this in between the bell? It takes 18 months to get something on the master schedule, perfectly fine. Uh, not every kid in a club wants to game, but what we can do is give them these beyond the game challenges. These are challenges that we've created in NACEF. We do several of these throughout the scholastic year. We put them up and let kids challenge themselves. You can see some various titles there where they're leaning into more than just the playing part. They're doing other things in that ecosystem. And they're showing us that they've actually mastered this for which we grant scholarships to individuals or grants to clubs where money is set aside for kids in trust that when they go to college, hey, NASEP, I want to apply to UCI or I want to go to Norco College. I want to start my, my college career there. Great. You've got a kitty of $200, $300, $500 dollars that you can apply toward books and tuition to do whatever it is to further your college career. So grants at schools are when we're able to meet again. Uh, we like better monitors. We want to upgrade the video cards. Uh, now we've got a, a kitty of money where, that we can use to help make that happen all by taking these challenges upon ourselves. We put out rubrics. If we were to go to our website, then I can put that during our uh, question and answer period in the chat. You can go onto our website and look at what those challenges are. Full rubrics about what's expected. Students do research, students do analysis. They've got to give us results. They take a flip grid video of themselves and explain what it is they do, why it is they do. So we're having them do all those class-like activities just under this aegis of esports, they're learning chocolate broccoli style and don't even realize they're reproducing in a way that's just like class. So I'm watching my clock and I know I'm talking as quickly as I can, but we're running a little bit out of time. Uh, these are six things that I get at every board meeting, every parent info night, when I talk to teachers about how do you know you're keeping my kids safe from the addiction mentality and profile through online toxicity and bullying to how do you pick the games you play? I'll tell you that in general, it's the club that is the antidote for most of these things. Clubs meet at least three times a week. Uh, obviously, we're going to practice for a game we play. If we're going to play, we do play that challenge. And then there's one day where we do no gaming at all. It's about the club activities. This is the sublimation about how I can do something else around esports, but it's not more screen time. It's not me working my thumbs. I'm actually doing something, using another set of skills the club needs from me to be that person to further our aims as a club. So you all as clubs are completely in control. You determine which games you play. You determine the titles. We posit several every year, but maybe your club is a Rocket League only team. And that's what you want to play. Great. Maybe you play Hearthstone, the electronic card-based turn-based game. Fantastic. We will show you other clubs that also like it as much as you do. We'll put you in your own league. We'll get you talking to each other and you can form your own tournaments and kids feel as vindicated and as valuable by playing games that matter to them. Mr. Brown, Mr. Brown, can I play Grand Theft Auto? Can I do Rainbow Six? You would imagine there are some titles out there that are polarizing. Lots of teachers, lots of kids will tell you why it's good. We tend to walk away from those. I know clubs play them. I can't be in 1,200 clubs to check them all, but you will not see those as NACEF tournament games 
or things that we necessarily espouse. We'll tell you that there are other ways to get that itch scratched. So if you like a shooter, there's Overwatch, there's Apex Legends, there's Fortnite, there is Valorant. There are lots of ways kids can participate in the unique ways that they want to. Another good partner, she may be on the, the line here with us today, Sue Thoughts from Common Sense Media. We are always in contact with them, looking at what's new and great. This is a giant database built of, by, and for parents, so parents can see what's really happening. And we look to parents to help guide us in our selections. So how do you know you've got everything ready for esports? Uh, again, please don't need to write all this down. I'll make this slide deck available to you. But it's having space when we're able to get space back together. It's having the right kinds of hardware. And somebody asked in chat earlier, Kevin, which kinds of things do I need? What kind of hardware? Depends on the game you're playing. Certain games like Rocket League, now it's free and it's across all platforms. You can play on PC. You can play on a laptop. You can play on a console. If you've got a Nintendo Switch, you can play on that. Um, are there differences in terms of equity? Certainly a PC with a high power processor and a great video card is gonna have a lower frame per second or high frame per second rate, low ping, and you're gonna be able to do more. If you're trying to play in your Chromebook laptop, wah, wah, not gonna work, but there are other games you can be playing that will work on different kinds of platforms and we can help you with that. Uh, IT people in the house, this is for you. Before you start forming any club on your campus or your community-based organization, please make sure your IT people are in the room discussing this with us because they're the ones who are going to have to help you with installation of all of this, making sure you got proper bandwidth, making sure security protocols are followed so kids can chat in the right ways, access ports in the right ways, use games in the right ways. So IT absolutely needs to be part of this. You've got to find that general manager, somebody who raises the hand and says, okay, I guess it's me, kids are telling me, or I'm great at this game. I am a Final Fantasy buff. I am the 99th level red mage and I will get my kids safely across all the quests. Nicholas is laughing. That would be me, that and Beastmaster and Samurai. That's my gym. But I can help you with that. What else do you want to do? It, it's got to be a coalition of the willing. And then lastly, teachable content, if and when you want it, it's definitely available. Let me look at the chat. I saw something just pop up there. Yes, Mark says, so important. That's about IT, I imagine. Absolutely. Got to have them as partners because we have learned in the early, early days, NASEF 1.0, when we said, we we're going to play League of Legends. And we had no idea that there were 43 different programs stealthily operating in the background, accessing ports on school time, on school materials, which could have let in any kind of creepy factor. We didn't know. We just wanted kids to play. And IT slammed the door on our fingers and said, oh, no, 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 no. Nay, we shut all this down. We said, well, before you shut it down, can we talk about this? And they said, before you talk about this, should you have called us first? Lesson learned. I'm in. And so now I will always tell everybody, IT needs to be at the table as you're beginning to form this idea about clubs for you, which leads to competitions. How can we play? What do we do? These are some of the games we play, not all the games we play. Which games? Whichever ones are important to you, your schools, your districts, your parents, your students may say, this is us. I keep going to uh, Paris Unified, no, Hemet rather, Unified in West Valley High School. They were thugs in Super Smash Brothers. They would come like the horde over the hills. If you told them there was a Smash Brothers tournament on a Saturday anywhere, they would rent a bus and come and get you, prove their point, beat you up, take your lunch money, and then go back home because that was their thing above and beyond all of the games. Were they great at League of Legends? Not so much. Are they really good at Rocket League? You all are forewarned. I'm telling you, I saw this last weekend at ISTE. Chris Runcy got the team. But you'll play the games that are amazing for you all, that matter to you. We gotta mitigate, kids can't play everything, nor do we play all games all the time. There can be casual days, days where you let your students teach other students how to play the cool things. I play a mobile game called Summoner's War. I still get mocked by my colleagues. It's the third largest game in Korea, but we don't seem to know about that here. But there are ways to introduce that and get kids excited so that they realize there's more than just one thing going on. Click, let's get to the next one. Um, again, we mentioned about coaching. We work with uh, Connected Camps. And again, this coaching is also free for you. We choose uh, very sagaciously who we are allowed to come in. They have to interview and apply. They got to show us that they know game chops and can break it down for students, but also that they're the right kind of grad student, right kind of near peer to be able to work with the attitudes and the personalities that can be part of an esports team. And it, we get letters every year from our coaches. We would not have gotten as far as we did were it not for Coach Sheila or Coach Casey or whomever. 
and they're located in different time zones. So if anybody's calling from outside of California, we've got somebody uh, in a state near you that can help work with you on that. Briefly, we have the Scholastic Fellows Program we started last year. Here is the uh, initial class, the inaugural class of 24 educators at the middle school, high school, and also community-based organizational level who took an entire year to take their curriculum, what they were teaching, and modify it through the lens of esports, which they've now given back to us in terms of filling up our community library, making this available to you all so you can understand their experience, whether it is as particular as coding, and how to use Python to do certain things in games, or how just a, how do you start this up on a shoestring? How do I use school LCAP funding to get my club started? And all kinds of things in between. There's an application process for this. Uh, we do vet this out, but this year we've got several, I think we've got close to 30. We've got attendees from South Africa, from Israel, from Mexico and Canada that have joined us. So it truly is an international endeavor, something that you as educators can partake in, but also your kids will be able to compete and work with them. As I said, we come from all over the States. Best of all, it's my favorite F word. It's all free. Everything we do, everything we offer. There are groups out there that will monetize your kids, charge, charge you a certain amount per student per semester, just to focus on one aspect of esports. We're giving you the whole package. We're leaning into it the way that you and the kids want to lean into it. And it all is for free, all made available to you through several charitable foundations headed up by the Sam Welly Foundation. Let me check chat really quickly. How can we become fellows? Again, Benjamin, uh, there is a, I can put this in the chat for you in just a minute, but if you go to the NASEF website, if you look under learning or under clubs, there is a sub window. It says uh, Scholastic Fellows, click on that and the application, the whole process is right there for you. We started humbly three years ago almost, beginning of 2018 after the thought experiment, 25 high schools in Southern California, 38 teams. As of the end of last month, almost 1,200 teams across 48 states and my bingo card's almost done. Wyoming's almost in my pocket, Vermont right behind it. Seven countries, over 10,000 students. And again, six to 8% growth every week. We must be doing something right because people are signing up, they're finding value. Kids and parents are as well. Not such a heavy lift. I threatened this, somebody said, my phone must be blowing up. It is now, if you ring it, he will come. It's right here, that's my actual cell phone number. You may start texting me, you may call me. I do turn it off at a certain point in the middle of my night, but I will respond to you. It will be my great pleasure to help you get club set up, or if you've got a club to help further your endeavors, wherever you and your kids are taking this, happy to come along for the ride. Kevin, With there that, was a question of, about please. Benjamin. Okay, go ahead. What was the question? Is there yet a central database of colleges, their programs, clubs, and games on offer so we can show admin and parents the high school to college pipeline when weighing the controversial games students want versus other stakeholder interests? We, I don't doubt that we're working on that in NASA. If you would imagine that colleges are jumping on board every day, every week, every month. Somebody's trying to create the next new certificate program or a minor or a major or full on degree program. It's very fluid. There are north of 250 colleges and universities across the US, mostly concentrated east of Mississippi River. So um, there are lists out there but we do not have it all yet in one place. Again, what, what are their majors? What are the games they play? Um, we can work together. I can give you what I've got about that. Again, you see my email. Any of you may email me at any point, any questions you've got, I will get back to you and let you know what's going on. But with this, let me stop sharing. I'll put this back up. I'm interested in all of you. What do you all want to talk about? What questions do you have? Go ahead and open your mic. I'll be able to see you when you start talking and I'll get those questions answered. There was another one in the chat. UCI has an esports business degree, no? A uh, certificate program. There are four classes you take, 12 credits, $2,500. And this gives you an overview. It gets into the marketing, the managing of a team, the business proposal aspect, and about tournament organization. So interesting, if you were a teacher and you wanted to really lean into this because you wanted to grow an esports club with a team that performed as well as your hockey, your football, your swim club, Maybe a good investment, maybe a good way for a sports director to get into this and understand the operable nuts and bolts. And again, not trying to sell UCI. I just know they have it out there. 
Uh, I know that we're getting same questions from Singapore. I was on a call last night with our international partner saying, how do we reproduce the smarts they're doing? Because we would like to do that here in Singapore. We would like to have that credential that shows a teacher, an adult has passed through the gauntlet and actually gone through proper educational channels and produced something so that now that person can do that for us here in our district or in our country. So definitely UCI has one. I know Norco College uh, in Riverside is working on one at this point. Uh, based right now around game design, game theory, but I think they're looking to trick that out and redo it to make it more aligned with what we see in that ecosystem, that it touches more of those levers so it's a more well-rounded experience. Again, esports doesn't live in any one domain. It's that alchemy of several domains. Good questions, though. It's Kevin. Yes. Hi, Tim Mann. I'm in the Temecula Valley School District. Hi, Tim. Hey. Um, so from a high school standpoint where I work, uh, what would the basic look like? I'm at a continuation school and we think this would be fantastic to bring to our students for engagement and yes. um, just their buy-in, uh, motivation, all those things you guys have talked about. What would be the first uh, baby steps in my area um, as an administrator to start something? Is it just an EA sports club kind of thing? And adding to it with COVID, what would, would that change anything? So I'll tell you right now for COVID won't change anything because what we're doing now is what kids do in esports. They right. log into their game, they go up to a virtual lobby, they find their squad, they gear up, they look for an opponent, and then they run into it, right? So they're already doing it. They're used to it better than we are. So esports, not at all affected by COVID, not at all. For your district and specifically for alternative education, we work with lots of alt ed schools. We work with kids uh, in incarceration, specifically down in San Diego County. Uh, I think Dr. Alicia Butters might actually be talking to this simultaneously about what they're doing in San Diego, but this is a huge attractor. It's a, as I said, this is what defeats chronic absenteeism and suspension. Mm -hmm. Kids will form up, they will toe the line, they will moderate themselves because they want what it is you're bringing. So how do we get it started? Usually it's with this same kind of presentation, maybe truncated so that it fits uh, an administrator's attention span because they're very busy, but giving them this first blush I can send out documents to anybody who wants it. We have a document we lovingly call light reading. It is a bunch of material squeezed into one PDF, but there's an administrator's guide, there's an IT guide, there's a parent's handout worksheet, all these things to talk about the benefits of this through the lens of CTE and others and research uh, talking points that you can then use to have those conversations. And I will join you. I do this as my full-time job, getting on the phone during school time, after school time, late at night, whenever the council meets, to be able to be that dial a friend. And Kevin, whose name should be Kevlar, he's bulletproof, will take all those tough questions and will answer those for parents and administrators about why this is good, how this can start. It doesn't have to cost $100 or $8,000, like Mark Sennett was saying. It can be started relatively inexpensively, and it does work for students in specialized populations. Thank you. You're welcome. So that takes us to the end of the session. Um, we just want to thank you, Kevin, for such a great presentation. Thank and you. to remind everybody that all the materials are um, going to be available on the SCED app. And we also welcome you to use the SCED to provide feedback so we can continue to provide you with the support you need for the eSports program. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Talk to you all soon. Thank you.